What's up guys? Today we're talking about central cord syndrome. This is one of the um, incomplete spinal cord injuries that we're going to go over. So we have like anterior cord, posterior cord, central cord, brown to cards, which is where you have the stab wound for half of the spinal cord affected. So, you know, we got a lot of different things going on guys. So let's get into it with central cord syndrome. So important thing to know about central cord syndrome is that it's going to be affecting this ligament right here is the ligamentum flavum. And so ligamentum flavum kind of runs all the way down the spinal cord along like the transverse processes and also into the spinous processes of the spinal column. So the spinal cord, imagine there's a spinal cord in here, guys, where it's like no, 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 spinal cords in there, blah, blah, blah. So that's what's going on when it comes to this. And that what's happening is this is an incomplete spinal cord injury, which means that there's still some sensory there's still some motor, but we're having issues with like one of them or they're not to the normal capacity. Remember with a complete SCI, we have no sensory and no motor below the level of the lesion. So that's what we got to think about when it comes to spinal cord injuries. Etiology of this. So this is the big things we want to go over. Hyperextension of the cervical spine. So that's usually what's going on with this due to a motor vehicle accident. So we're thinking of things to highlight Oop, that was the eraser. We're thinking of things to highlight motor vehicle accident, cervical spine, hyperextension. That's the big three. That's probably what's going on when it comes to central cord syndrome. So you can see that the ligamentum flava is the part that's being affected. So we can see that because it's hyperextended backwards that we're seeing that there's little bulging kind of things going into the spinal cord itself. So the spinal cord normally is just hanging out like this, but now it's got this bulge kind of going into it which is squishing the center of it. So you can see that the vertebral bodies are also going back. So it's getting squished from both sides. So that's why the central bit has the most pressure in it. And that's why the central bit is, is the problem because it's getting squished from both sides. So that's why the biggest pressure is gonna be in the middle there. And that's why it's called central cord syndrome because that is the part that has the most pressure and the most affected. So we'll also see other reasons would be cervical spondylosis. And then remember spondylosis is where there's, um, uh, like narrowing due to some other patho pathological reason. A tumor would be another one. So if there's a spinal cord tumor, so let's say you have your, your spinal cord, if there's a tumor pressing on it, that could be a big problem as well. RA, just due to the fact that there's ligamentous laxity when it comes to rheumatoid arthritis and then cervical stenosis. Remember cervical stenosis is a narrowing. So normal spinal cord looks like that. With stenosis, it'll kind of look like that because it's narrowing because the vertebral bodies are getting more and more narrow. So we'll see that it's starting to cause radiculopathy and other problems and just squishing the spinal cord in general. So remember, when it comes to this hyperextension of the cervical spine, usually due to a motor vehicle accident, and it's just getting squished with central cord syndrome. So what does it look like? So this is the big things, guys. Upper extremities are more affected than lower extremities and motor is more affected than sensory. There is going to be some sensory below the level of the lesion because remember it's an incomplete spinal cord injury. So there is some sensory stuff going on and we're going to see some occasional problems with bowel and bladder. Um, but those are usually going to resolve. Uh, usually, like I think like almost 80% of cases, they do end up resolving, but being careful and knowing that they might need a bowel and bladder program for a while because it is a spinal cord injury. So understanding we might need to consult with uh, pelvic floor PTs. Um, an MRI would be used to find it because MRIs like are able to see this kind of picture here where we see the spinal cord and how it's being squished and stuff like that. Let me just erase this so we can look again. So see how it's being uh, squished here with those that is what we're looking at, seeing that it's squished. Again, the big th way that I remember this, so this is the big things, that upper is more affected than lower and that motor is more affected than sensory. So this is how I remember it. So we have C for central cord, upper, more involved than lower, and motor, more involved than sensory. So if we look at that with our acronym, our acronym is C-U-M. So CUM is how we're gonna remember central cord syndrome if you would like to use it this way for uh, central cord being that upper is more affected than lower and that motor is more affected than sensory because the board is gonna ask you about this in a differential diagnosis sort of way. So understanding that that is how it might show up on the exam, trying to see like what kind of incomplete spinal cord injury is this? 
come for central cord syndrome. So that is how I like to remember it. How are we treating it? So remember this guys with a, a spinal cord injury, we got to wait until the person is medically stable because what's the main cause of this? Probably a motor vehicle accident. And what's happening in a motor vehicle accident? Well, a lot of things, people could end up dying or passing away um, due to their injuries to, because of a motor vehicle accident. So we're making sure that the person is medically stable first and that they're not going into cardiac arrest or anything like that, or having anything bad happen before we start rehab. So we're waiting until the doctor clears because the first thing we want to do is preserve this person's life because this is a very life-threatening injury. If it's in a motor vehicle accident or something like that. Um, and so we're just kind of waiting until everything's okay with that person. Watch out for autonomic dysreflexia. I'm gonna make a whole separate video about this, but I'm gonna talk about it anyways right now, guys. So remember with autonomic dysreflexia, this is a life-threatening thing where the blood, patient's blood pressure is going through the roof, like through the roof. We have our patient over here, they're sad. They're sweating. They're dying, bad. We're getting the nurse, we're asking for help. So this is a SOS moment. We are asking for help. Um, we're, what are we doing when we see autonomic dysreflexia? Step one, sit up. We want to sit the patient up, see what's going on. Step two is where we check for problem. And what do I mean by problem? It's usually going to be a catheter. It's going to be kinked or something like that. And it's going to be causing a problem. So like their normal catheters like this, Let's say it's a catheter and it's going and we're seeing that it's all squished and everything. So we're going to want to fix that because that could be causing a problem. So essentially it's some sort of noxious, noxious stimuli that's causing a problem. And remember when it comes to uh, autonomic dysreflexia, this is happening with SCI patients who are a T6 or above. So remember T6 or above for autonomic dysreflexia, medical emergency. And what is happening with our patients who are central cord? Usually it's a cervical spine kind of thing. So we're seeing C7 through C3. That is probably, that's where the problem is. So we're making sure that we're addressing this because this is a problem. And we're going to keep an eye on what medications this patient is on because it could affect therapy. So like, let's say they're on blood pressure medication, see how those affect therapy because of their autonomic dysreflexia, all of that fun stuff, just making sure everything's okay with this patient. Some PT interventions. If I could harp on one thing, that's the most important thing in the entire world. It is patient and caregiver education. Like I can't underline this and highlight this and star this enough. Like this is literally the most important thing in the world because we wanna make sure that we're doing weight shifting positional changes to avoid pressure ulcers, because then again, our patient will be very sad. They have a pressure ulcer, also puts them at risk of like infection and other hospital borne illnesses. So we wanna be careful with that. So again, patient caregiver education on like, you know, bowel and bladder program, intermittent catheterization, understanding their physical limitations because their upper extremities are gonna be affected. They're gonna need help with things, adaptive assisted devices, positional changes, just helping them adapt to their new way of life because understanding that this patient had a very life-changing injury and is now like essentially this person is probably disabled in some sort of way going to have to live the rest of their life differently um and so we're going to make sure that they're aware of this and being able to navigate their world and where they're at right now so patient caregiver education super important essentially the next most important thing and i know it's a little bit farther down is functional mobility to maximize the patient's level of function so this patient could regain some mobility and stuff like that it is an incomplete spinal cord injury there is a chance that they could get relatively back to normal they might still need a wheelchair or something like that or some sort of assisted system device to walk around but we could get them close to where they were before so we want to make sure that we're maximizing this patient's level of function by like working on what they absolutely can do. We wouldn't want to be working on walking with a patient who can't even get out of a chair. We want to work on things that are appropriate for this patient with their level of function. We're going to want to work on strengthening just in general, just ambulation and gait training to make sure that they're being safe, especially when we're working on balance and proprioceptive exercises to help them prevent them from falling. Because again, if our patient falls sad. We don't want our patients to fall. Assistive devices that we could use, we could use a platform walker, which is a walker that has this like little, instead of just your regular handlebars. So like, this is my terrible drawing of a walker. So like the regular walker just has like the little handlebars there. So like, this is looking down at the walker or whatever. Um, the platform walker instead has this whole thing for the patient to sit on with like little grab bars and stuff. So then they can put their hands on here. 
so then they can walk. And then making sure a bowel and bladder program is established because our patients might have that. And that kind of falls all the way back to patient education. And we might need to consult our pelvic floor PTs about that to help them out with that. So again, watch for autonomic dysreflexia. That's an easy on the boards can test you on to see what's going on. Then understand that we're working on what we got. So working on improving upper extremity strength because that's more effective than lower. And then also working on our motor skills because that's more effective than sensory. So just working on strengthening gait mobility, ambulation, maximizing their level of function and trying to have them be as functional as possible to reintegrate into the community. Keywords for this guys, remember hyperextension injury usually due to an MVA in the cervical spine. So all of these kind of go hand in hand with um, understanding that that's kind of the mechanism of injury when we're talking about a differential diagnosis and seeing that it's an incomplete spinal cord injury. So knowing that this isn't a complete one, they still have some function below the level of the lesion. And um, the boards is either going to ask you about just a straight up complete spinal cord injury, Asia scale A, that's how they like to say it. Remember, Asia is an acronym, then scale A, that's a complete spinal cord injury. And then for the other ones, they're gonna talk about like, you know, central cord, anterior cord, not so much posterior cord, and then bronze cards, all those definitely in the ballpark. And remember motor is more effective than sensory and upper is more effective than lower. So that's our fun acronym of come, super fun in order to remember this. You could also, if you really want to, Marvel Cinematic Universe, if you want to not use dirty acronyms, but I feel like the dirtier it is, the more I remember it. So I'll leave that up to you guys. All right, guys, sample question here. A physical therapist assistant is treating a patient with central cord syndrome. What would be the typical presentation of this patient? Number one, upper extremity is more affected than lower with sensory more affected than motor. Two, upper extremity is more affected than lower with motor more affected than sensory. Three, lower extremity is more affected than upper with motor more affected than sensory. Or four, lower extremity is more affected than upper with sensory more affected than motor. So I'll give you guys a second to think about this one. All right, guys, so our answer is number two, upper extremity is more affected than lower and motor more affected than sensory because this is our great acronym of come. So central, upper, motor. So we see that in our sentence, it's just asking, they have central cord syndrome, typical presentation, straight up definition question, upper extremities more than lower, motor more than sensory. So we're looking at this and you forget one of these things. You can at least get rid of lower that you know it's not that. And then you're like, okay, is it motor or sensory, motor or sensory, motor or sensory? Well, that's where our acronym kind of comes in where we can remember that motor is that, and then we can get rid of that. And then that also double eliminates number four. So then we get our answer is number two. So again, guys, just really just make sure you understand like the typical presentation for central cord syndrome, because literally the board just likes to ask you how it's like the, what the presentation is, especially when it comes to central cord syndrome, because this is one that if they could pick any of the like incomplete spinal cord injuries, they like to, to use this one. So you have our fun acronym to remember this, and I will see you guys in the next one. Take care.